that that didn't help you like hook hook you up with uh, Kobe Bryant? Yeah. So funny story with that. (laughs) So um, just sort of how the how the whole thing materialized. Um, So I was working for Tim for a while, and during the off season, there wasn't really much to do. Like March, you know, like March, April. Well, March, March, March was definitely dead. Yeah. So during one March, um, I sort of got to know Kevin McHale a little bit um, through the Celtics. You know, he was coaching in Minnesota or GM Minnesota back and forth. And he would come through our gym. Uh, he would practice at the, at the Celtics facility. I, I, I met him a couple of times. Great human being. One of the best human beings you ever want to meet. And, you know, so I, I met him a few times. Not much. He didn't really know me. I didn't really know him. So when I was in Chicago working for Tim full time, Tim had season tickets to the Bulls and he also had passes to go in the back, not in the locker room, but like in the tunnel where yeah. they would leave. And, you know, all the family members and stuff and agents and things would be back there. So like after every game, we would probably like, especially if there was a, a team that we had clients on that worked with us in the summertime, we would try to, you know, say hi and see if they needed anything. Yeah. Talk to anybody that we needed to talk to. So Kevin came through and was like, you know, Mike, you know, you got to stay at my house. We'll hang out. And, you know, and I was like, huh? Like <laughs> I knew Kevin, I didn't know Kevin like that. I was like, yeah. yeah, okay. So he kept on saying it like, you know, you need to do this. You need to do this. So uh, he gave me his number and we, we sort of talked from there, but so I got to know Kevin, especially when he was a GM in Minnesota and we had guys like um, OJ Mayo and stuff that we were going to work out for the draft. And at the time we we're big time draft prospects. Yeah. So I, I would give Kevin information on the players that we were working with, what they were good at, what they weren't good at, things like that. So I got, I got, a, you know, got to know Kevin pretty well. And so during this, during like Oh nine, um, Kevin was like, Hey, let's co- come to my house for a week. And, you know, like be around the team, you know, he was coaching. He came out of the front office to coach. So I was like, hey, I'm going to be coaching the team. I want you to come to practice, stay at my house. And I thought it was great. I was like, yeah. So like a month before that, there were like maybe in January, um, two months before that, in the New York Times, there was a piece by Michael Lewis who wrote Moneyball, um, that baseball book. Yeah. And there was a big thing on how the Houston Rockets, their GM at the time, Daryl Morey, who worked, I worked with with the Celtics. Yeah. He would give Shane Battier this sort of like dossier of information on how to guard Kobe Bryant. And it was a big article. It was very, very interesting about how like he still put up points, but he was very less, he was probably least efficient against Houston than any other team. So I, I read the article. I knew about it. I was staying at Kevin's at the time for the week and we were going to practice back and forth. And I, I got at the time also during the season, that was during the season. Tim was working with Kobe, you know, rehabbing his knee and, and, and working with him and traveling with him. Yeah. He goes, Hey, Kobe's going to be calling you. Uh, or, you know, he's going to reach out to you about this article. Have you read it? I go, yeah, yeah. It was about two months ago. And he goes, okay, well, he's going to email you. So Kobe, I, he said, well, how, how do you want him to reach you? I said, well, I don't need to talk to him. He could just email me like all, all what he's thinking about. Yeah. And he was like, right, okay. So I got this email. I was like, Hey Mike, look, um, I read this article. Um, I'm very interested in knowing what other teams sort of think or know about me. So I could sort of combat against it and, and be more efficient, better player. So I want you to sort of do a fact finding mission with, you know, what they, how they play me. So I was like, all right. So, you know, I was staying with Kevin at the time. So I was like, all right, fuck this. I'll just ask Kevin and, you know, and then I called up a bunch of scouting friends that I know assistant coaches that I know that do game plans and, asked him about Kobe and you know Kobe at the time was obviously one of the best players in the league yeah and so everybody gave me the same answer and you know they're like oh you just got to force him into tough shots and this and that you know sort of like that bs that you see with coaches that get interviewed in between quarters in the nba they just yeah. give you like vague answers yeah yeah <laughs> and one thing i do know I, I i'm no genius by any stretch of the imagination you know but I do know people and I know players. Yeah. And I know that if you came, if I came back to say this to Kobe, like, Oh, they're just going to force you in a tough shot. So take fewer tough shots and then leave it. Yeah. I'd never hear from the guy again. Now I wasn't angling for a job with this. My job 
as you know, as he was a client for Tim, for Tim, was hey, you know, do the best job you can for the client, and I will. I want to service the client, so I knew that that wasn't going to cut it. Yeah. So yeah. what I did was I went back and I watched about eight games. I said, hey, Kobe, I didn't like what I got for information. Let me like do my own fact finding for myself and I'll give you, a, I'll give you what I think. And you go, fine, that's fine. So I probably watched about eight games, just got a notepad and just started writing. Yeah. And I watched exactly how Houston played him, the types of shots he was getting. And then I was like, you know what? Okay. I, I understand. You know, Shane Batty is one of the most disciplined defenders you'd ever want to meet. Yeah. Wasn't like a Greek freak. Wasn't like that. Wasn't like built like that. Yeah. But he, he had size. He had size and he had a brain. And I think, you know, in defense, that's what you need. Like, especially to be a good wing defender. He had discipline. He had, he, he had a brain in his head. And he, he knew what made sense and what didn't. And what was a tough shot, what wasn't. So what they did was they forced him to drive to the paint, mostly. Every shot he took, a hand in his face, discipline. Battier never left his feet, so he wasn't going to get foul calls. He was always going to be disciplined to funnel him to the baseline, keep him out of the middle, and get his hand up in his face when he took a shot. Yeah. But the big thing they had was Yao Ming. So he would funnel him to Yao Ming. Everybody would rotate over. Remember, they had Tom Thibodeau as their defensive coordinator now. Yeah, and Jeffrey yeah. and Gundy was their coach. You probably wouldn't get a better coaching staff ever in the history of mankind than those two guys. Yeah. So they knew. They, they knew, look, he's going to take tough shots because of his ego and his talent level. Shane's not going to leave his feet. He's going to be very disciplined. He's going to get a hand in his face. And if you Google Shane Battier, Kobe Bryant, you're going to see a couple of pictures of literally Kobe taking a, uh, a shot with a hand like this. <laughs> and if he's going to drive to the basket, he's going to like have Yao Ming to try to go over, which is huge. He's like 22 feet tall. Yeah, so yeah. like, and everybody's rotating over. He's taking this tough shot and his ego of not passing the ball, not because he didn't want to or not because he couldn't, but because it just, he, he felt as though this was a challenge. Yeah. So not only did I tell him about the defensive rotations of Houston and how they were playing on Yao Ming and things. And my big thing with that was Yao Ming's very slow. He's very aggressive at the rim, protecting it because of his size, but he's very slow laterally moving his feet. Wow. All yeah. the clips that I saw, even movements off the ball when he wasn't even involved. I was like, this guy's pretty slow. And then I would go back and do my homework on Yao, not even playing the Lakers, but playing other teams where he was in situations where he had to move his feet. So I'm like, Kobe, first of all, we got to, you got to move, you got to move the ball more. Like, and not all, like, so I went into this thing where, okay, I'm going to give him this, this sort of package of Houston Rockets. Yeah, but yeah. then I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go all in on this. I'm going to, I'm going to give him this whole synopsis of what he wasn't doing the things that he I thought was impacting this team in a negative way without him even maybe noticing. Yeah. So my big thing was like, yeah, Paul Gasol was one of the more gifted, skilled players that ever played the game. You had these, you had this roster of good players, not great players, but good players. Him and Yao, I mean, him and Paul were the two guys. But then they had guys like Derek Fisher, who was a decent spot-up player. But my big thing, the two players that he really didn't need to use more of against Houston and in general were Pau Gasol. And not only just throwing it to Pau and to say score in the post, but like what's going to happen was when you drive, four players are going to rotate over and help. So like you're going to have these people popped in the paint. You have Trevor Ariza, who wasn't a really good offensive player by himself where you throw it to him, he's going to get you a basket. But yeah. he's a good guy spotting up on the weak side that uh, Trevor was a really good athlete. He was like six, eight long armed, not a great shooter, but a good spot up shooter. And he could also cut and drive. So these four players are rotating over. They're not even worrying about Trevor Reza. So my thing is like, when you drive and everybody rotates over Trevor by himself, isn't a really good offensive player, but Trevor by himself yeah. spotted up, could catch and shoot, can catch and drive and can cut to the basket and you could have a field day with that. But 
that's just something sort of on the periphery that you need to use throughout the year, not only against Houston, but throughout the year. Yeah. But the big thing against Houston is when they re- rotate over and they got Yao in the paint, you got Powell who at the time bigs weren't shooting threes besides Dirk and a couple other guys. Yeah. And I'm not saying Powell should shoot threes, but when you go baseline and Yao's at the basket, you got to re- relocate Powell to the elbow area. So you can just sort of give him the ball and he'll have easy shots as much as he wants. The big thing that's going to happen that you want is when you pass the ball out and Yao's got to like lumber to get to Pau, Pau could just drive right by because Pau, like Yao can't move his feet. Yeah. So I gave him this thing, which is a little bit of a, a lot of it was sort of negative, not negative, but it was sort of on the borderline of like, hey, bro, this is fine. You, what you do is good. But this, like, you're not doing this and this and this, and it's really infecting your team. So I said this. I said, look, you got to move. Like, they're going to want you to hold the ball because you're a great offensive player. They want you to hold the ball. So what you need to do is you got to make quick movements. You get the ball, catch and shoot, catch and drive it, you know, and and make quick movements to get your shot off. And then when you're driving and they rotate over, you got to pass the ball. You got to give it up. You got to give it up to Powell because it's going to be a field day for him. Trevor is going to be a really good player for you down the line, you know, in the playoffs, if you continue to do this. And then also you, you need to be able to have Yao step out and guard you on certain situations. And if he does, don't be ego driven where you're just going to jump over him and score. Yeah. You got to go, you got to side, go move side to side. He's got two cinder blocks for legs. He can't move, but he can really be good at the rim where you're just trying to challenge him at the rim. Of course he could block your shot or, or alter it. Yeah. So anyways, so the game comes that night, they play Houston. He has an unbelievable night, like 30, whatever. And he's listening. He's doing everything that I asked him to do, passing the ball, quick movements. Yeah. He's going to hold the ball because he's a great offensive player at times. And that's fine. But the big part came at the end of the game, probably like a minute and a half left. It was like overtime or it was a close game. Fourth quarter, maybe it's so long ago. You forget. Yeah. But like Ron Artest is doing a hell of a job on him. They had Ron and they had Batty Eight. So, but like they had Ron on him at this possession. He, he was toughing it up. He was banging him. He was being physical with Kobe. So anyway, play comes up, pick and roll or this drive and Yao steps up out, away from the basket out of the painted garden. So instead of just like trying to like pull up, he went, he just like, changed direction, got right to, got him on his hip, went right to the basket score. Yeah. So, and, and then besides giving him this big report, I gave him a report on every player that he's going to be defending and every player that would be defending him strengths, weaknesses, film, all that stuff. So I gave him this whole big bucket of things. I thought that's it. Mikhail's laughing. You know, he, he had a function at, for the Minnesota. So we were at the arena. I was in some lounge watching the game yeah. and you know, he can't, he would come in and check on it, laugh about it. And I would laugh about it too because I thought I'd never do this again. So at the end of the game, he gets he goes, "You think I'll ever hear from him again?" I go, "No." I said, "This is probably a one game thing." So uh, he gets interviewed after the game, Kobe, and then about ninety seconds later, I get a, a message on my phone. He goes, "I get San Antonio. I want you to do the same thing for me tomorrow." And it ended up being four years of getting him ready for every game, um, scouting report stats video um every pertinent detail of information of every player he'll be defending and defending him every play they run for that player strengths weaknesses where to, where to force him to on the floor where they're going to try to force him on the floor matchups that will be for teammates that he could take advantage of where it's not always about him and then i would also critique his play so yeah. basically my you know i, I would do i would communicate with them on, on every game day sometimes on non-game days but mostly on game days yeah so i would get i was in chicago he was in la and unless he was traveling and he would get his report at 7 a.m and then to get ready for the game and he'd go to shoot around do all what he's got to do and shoot around and we'd start talking right around 12 31 o'clock yeah. we'd start emailing each other back and forth and we'd probably send i don't know anywhere from six to 40 emails mostly lower numbers but sometimes it would be back and forth and he would like you know we would talk about the scouting report he would talk about things that he saw maybe he agreed maybe he didn't agree hey can you get me more information on this guy 
and we would talk hoop for six hours, you know, back and forth, not in every minute, but like, you know, some days are more busy than others. Yeah. So then probably up to about 90 minutes or so before game time, we would talk to each other through email. I always wanted to be through email. I thought it was more professional that way. And, and it was easier for him. And I don't want people hearing what we're talking about anyway. If they're if with an air shot, he could just type it. So after the game, again, we'd start talking again a couple hours. I would give him video of hit all his possessions, all his offense, all his defense. And then I would critique him, give him this like one page deal of what I thought he did well, what I thought he didn't do well. He wanted to know more like what he didn't do well, which yeah. was fine. And then he, we'd start talking about that. And so that was four years of doing that, of report in the morning, talk about it, watch his game, critique his game, talk about the critique, and then repeat. So for four years. And um, I think that was one of the biggest educations I've ever had in basketball, learning how a player like that prepares for opponents, prepares in his workouts. You know, and I would work him out from time to time. Um, he, he'd, he'd send me, you know, he'd, he'd bring me out to L.A. once in a while. But I wasn't his workout guy. I was I was doing this yeah. because I yeah. felt as though there were enough workout guys. Yeah. And A, he's one of the best players that ever lived. So if I was going to be his workout guy or whatever, that would be great, too. But I thought that I can make a huge impact. And again, huge impact, meaning about one percent impact for him, which you know, you're not going to make a huge impact for him. But one percent is a huge impact. Yeah. Um, it's not like working with a rookie. The guy is one of the best players of all time. I'm not going to add all that much to his game, but I'll add about this 1%. And then, but I think the mental side, the talking about things, how can I do this better? How can I do that better? Why do you think this? Because he's not one, one of these players that you'd give him all this information and send you back a thumbs up and then you never hear from him until yeah. the next day or whatever. There was really good dialogue back and forth with him. So being able to learn that and how that guy prepares and being able to take that information and give it to other players, not his fade away or his, his jab game, which, you know, you could teach, but I think most players could really benefit more from the approach that he took of being a professional, as far as being early, staying late, studying his opponent, taking care of his body, getting his shots up workouts were like really streamlined. They weren't, they weren't things that he didn't wasn't going to do in a game. They all made sense. And being able to put it all together and, and talking to players about that, I think for me, was very beneficial you know, to any player that I work with. So to be able to do that was an honor for me, you know, being a having the access to a player at that level to the, for the time. Usually, you know, you're a trainer, you work with them an hour a day, you're done with them, you know, until the next day to be able to have an actual dialogue about the game is way more important to me than working them out. And, um, you know, I, I thought that was, that was an unbelievable experience to be able to do that. That's amazing. That's so, that's so amazing. You got to work with Kobe Bryant, like, you know, a generational player and just a superstar and, you know, one of the all time greats. Um, what well, like did, like his intensity, did he ever like message you at like 2 a.m. or anything like that? Oh, no. Yeah. Did he? I mean, it was that, that was that was a lot of our conversations. Really? 2 30 a.m., 3 a.m. Yeah. And, and, you know, I know you're a, a young whippersnapper, but there was a show back in the 80s, it, you know, a pretty popular show called Night Rider. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. About that futuristic car, right? Yeah. That talk. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and the red. Uh, the little red thing in front of the car made the swooshing sound like yeah. right? so I wanted to make sure I knew he was texting me or emailing me whatever so I had that as my tone <laughs> when he called and it was the scariest thing most it was like watching a Stephen like watching a Stephen King movie like because in the middle of the night you would just hear this <laughs> oh my god boy yeah. And we would talk and he would like, it'd be like, hey, what'd you think about this? Or what'd you think about that? Or, you know, or just venting, venting about a teammate, venting about referee calls, venting about not being able to do enough. Um, and again, being that soundboard for one of the best players that ever lived and be able to talk hoop. And he respected me because I told him the truth. Yeah. You know, not every, every, not every conversation was you were the best um it's it's all their fault it's not your fault you know 
it was, you know, it wasn't all our conversations, don't get me wrong, but he knew that he was going to get an honest answer out of me. And he knew that if I didn't know something, that I wasn't going to just try to impress him and tell him something just because now I could come back to Kobe Bryant with something. He yeah. knew if I didn't know that, A, I was going to do every possible thing to find that out for him. Yeah. But if I didn't know at the end of the day, I'm going to say that I didn't know. Yeah. You know, um, know. one of the funniest moments was like, he didn't know much about the negotiation for um, the players association. Yeah. Like when they were going to, when they locked out. Yeah. So I was getting all this information. He goes, Mike, what, what's going on with this thing? And he knew, he yeah. knew like, but like, I was like, look, this is what they're really fighting about Kobe. In my opinion, and he was like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Look, you know, like it's it was it was it was unbelievable. It's like this is Kobe Bryant. He could get a whole legal team to be telling him this stuff. And it's I'm like getting a sandwich at this fucking burger place in the downtown Chicago, like just like texting Kobe about trying to end the lockout. It was it was it was pretty cool, man. Like Kobe was, you know, damn, like, God, it's sad, man. Like, yeah, you know, it's but like. Yeah, like being just this basketball, like we never talked about anything else. We didn't talk about, like, I wasn't trying to be Kobe's friend. Yeah. I was trying to be someone that he trusted. And and Tim always taught me with the client, look, always be there for your client, always be cordial with your client, but you don't want to be best friends with your client because you're to be objective, you can't be their best friend. And, and that's the first thing I told him. I said, look, Kobe, we're not going to be friends. Don't take offense to this. We're not going to be friends because of this. Yeah, I'm not yeah. going to ask you for tickets. I'm not going to want to go out to eat with you all the time. I want to stay in Chicago doing this. I don't need to be out in LA. I need to be doing this. Yeah, and yeah. Um, I need to be doing it this way. And that was, the, that was the great dynamic between us that, A, we weren't in each other's faces all the time. We were doing it by email and text and um, – he knew that he could count on me to a tell him the truth b that all i want to do is talk basketball i wasn't going to try to you know ask him about his life or his family or anything else you know because now he knew that like he knew the he knew we both knew the deal and i think that that allowed me to do my job and you know again being able to talk basketball with him I mean, the other stuff was intense, like getting all the intel, getting the videos done on time, getting, you know, because again, I'd have to be, I'd have to plan for games in advance. And like, that was my second job. And my second job was way more hour, you know, spent way more hours than my first job and than my main job working for Tim. And it was crazy, man. But it was, again, one of those things that now I know those big law firms have to get ready for this, these billion dollar cases that you have to like do all this research and stuff for. Yeah. That's, I felt like a litigator for four years. I felt like I worked for the biggest litigator in Chicago because um, he wanted that information. And he knew that if you were like, you could tell, I never did this to him, but you could tell that if you were half-assed in an assignment, he would know and he would tell you about it. Yeah, And I, you know, that's like, he made you work that much harder. You know, he made you work and, and, and put your ducks in a row. Hey, look, not everything I'm going to say is going to be right all the time. Not everything we're going to agree with all the time. Sometimes we agree to disagree. But, you know, he knew that I was going to be thorough in my research for him. That's so, that's, it's crazy that you got able to work with him. It's just amazing. And I, I can only imagine, yeah, it seems, yeah, I mean, his basketball he's got to be off this world. So I'm sure he knew when, like, I'm sure you could pick up if you weren't doing your job. So like, but like, yeah, yeah it, it was just, lit. Yeah. I mean, look, he was professional, but yeah. it was literally like, you know, you name every horror character there is Freddy Krueger, Jason Voorhees, Michael, you know, Michael Myers, all those guys put together. That's him. And you don't, you just didn't want to get to that other side of him, you know? Yeah. So I just, I, I just wanted to do my job and it, you know, ended up, ended up lucking out, you know, I, I I'm totally lucky. Like, Again, totally lucky. Uh, I was capable of doing that stuff, but totally lucky. And I made the most of it because I knew that he liked what I did because it was four years of doing that. Like he would have dumped me in a week yeah. and it, was, it, it lasted a while. And I think we had sort of a respect for one another as far as like he knew that I always had his back 
and he kept answering my emails. So that was a great, that was a great two-way relationship for me. And that, like, as far as that's concerned, you know, I'm a basketball nut, a junkie at it and being able to, to, to bounce things off of him and him bouncing things off of me with that. And I would ask him questions about his workouts and why he did certain things and, you know, ask him about certain players and why he thought they were good. And, you know, going through the thousands of emails, um, that I had with him, you know, I still have on my computer and I do it from time to time. Just remember our conversations are pretty, it was pretty cool deal. That's so cool. That's, that's really cool. And that's, that's like a once in a lifetime experience too, to like work with someone on that. I would say once in 10 lifetimes, to be honest. I mean, you know, first of all, to have access to a guy like that, get access to a guy like that is almost impossible, you know, especially because there's no social media, there's no DM in, there was no any of that. There was, you know, so it's hard to get access. B, they got to look you up and down and like, all right, what am I going to learn? Or what, how's this guy going to help me? Yeah. And then C, once you do all those two things that are almost impossible, you're like Indiana Jones, for God's sakes, you know, in the Temple of Doom, like, you know, and then all those things are done, keeping the job and keeping him, keeping him engaged for that amount of time you know, and, and thinking that what you do brought value to him were enough where he wasn't going to fire you. Cause he's one of those guys that, have, you know, if, you, if you're not, if you're not bringing him value for good reason, his, his time is way more valuable than most people's and he's not going to waste his time on people that are just going to give him fluff and things that he want. He thinks that they want, that they think that he wants to just hear or see, he wants people that are going to try to make him better. You know, and like I said, you're not going to make Kobe Bryant 10, 15, 20, 30, 50% better. It, he was just too far down the line he was like 30 years old yeah but, but what you can do is you can make little adjustments to him that could really make you know pay big dividends and you know in small doses that's 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 awesome that's amazing i have so many more questions but i want to i have them i have to be like another episode just talking about kobe because honestly i have like I have all these questions run through my mind but i think just for the show's sake, yeah, I, could, I could like do a whole show on Kobe himself, but oh, we could, yeah. I know it's 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 crazy, but like, I, and then what led you to the Mavericks position? And how you end up working with the player? Well, a hundred hundred percent, it was it was my work with Kobe. Okay. Like, okay. you know, um, Adrian Wojnarowski, who you know, everybody knows him as well, you know, throwing Woj bombs and stuff like that. But at the time, he was working for Yahoo, um, yeah, Yahoo Sports, yep. and he, you know, we 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 came up with a, we got built a little relationship. He did a story on Dwayne Wade um, a year before uh, playing for the Olympics in 08 and working with Tim and stuff. And, and so, you know, Woj and I have been, you know, close for about 10 years or so. And at the time, you know, I would be talking to him about it, you know, asking him his advice on stuff like, Hey, this is what I'm doing. This is, and, and I wasn't doing it where he's going to, you know write the story yeah yeah i don't think i don't think he sort of paid attention to it all that much besides our conversations he didn't think i don't think anybody really thought much of it including me i I didn't know i didn't know exactly what this thing was going to be so all of a sudden he's going deep into the playoffs and Woj is like sweet chuck he goes this this might be a pretty good story like you you might want to you know, we might do something. Is that all right? And I'm like, yeah. I, I said, first of all, you got to ask Kobe. If Kobe's okay with it, I'm good with it. And it was after the finals in 09, he wrote this huge story. And then Sports Illustrated wrote a story. And, um, well, actually, no, he wrote this big story. And then I, and then the next year in the playoffs, when they play Boston in the finals, and it was such a big deal because, you know, I'm from Boston. I worked for the Celtics a couple years back, you know, and they, you know, they, they they won in the series so like then sports illustrated new york times boston globe and a few other people do these stories on me about the work that i did because again now everybody's got a guy everybody's got a guy doing this right yeah. but back then nobody had a guy doing this and mm-hmm. it was sort of a new thing for everybody so i'll tell you what if twitter was a big thing back then i'd probably be a really really fucking rich guy right now mm-hmm. not rich but doing really well <laughs> yeah, yeah. like i could you could have done yeah. like it was funny on yahoo which at the time was much bigger than it is now but like the national stories at the time was like Obama, Iraq, um, something about the economy, and this story. 
like Yahoo had like these four things that came up, like yeah. four pictures, four, you know, four links to stories that was the biggest in the country at that point. And that was one of them. I wish I screenshotted it, but it was pretty cool. It was, it was more for me, it was comical than anything. It was cool because my friends would call me about it, but yeah. it was more like, it was surreal, man. It was a great deal, but that's, so like, so then I knew my thing with Kobe would end eventually. And it sort of ended in around 2012. And I get this, I got a, a call from Woj and Woj was at the, I don't think he was at the Sloan conference, but I think he talked to Cuban who was at, at the Sloan conference. And Mark was like, look, I'm looking to hire guys for my team that weren't really like, that aren't working in the NBA, that are sort of different. I don't want to just, I don't want to hire retreads. And so Woj reached out. He goes, hey, I, I floated your name, the Cuban, if that was okay. I'm like, yeah, for sure. I said, I don't think it will, nothing's going to come of it. I, I've had these conversations before. And I don't think it's going to, I don't think anything is going to happen. He goes, all right, whatever. So then all of a sudden I get a call about two weeks later from Rick, uh, from Danny Ainge. He goes, look, I think the Mavericks are going to look to hire you. I go, I said, oh yeah. I said, really? I said, I, I know I got a, I, I talked to Woj about it, but I didn't think it was going to go anywhere. He goes, well, I got a call from Donnie Nelson and Rick Carlisle. Like they asked questions about you. I think they're going to call. So Rick Carlisle called. We had a conversation. Um, it, it seemed like it was going to be, it was like at the end of the year too. It was like March. Yeah, And like, I, I thought that if anything's going to happen, maybe they'd bring me in a summer league. And if I'm going to work for the team, like summer league and build in to the beginning of the year. Yeah. So I talked to Rick. It didn't seem like Rick was all that interested. Maybe the next year I'd work for the team. And then, and then I'm like, all right. And then Donnie called me, Donnie Nelson. And he's like, Hey, you know, and then we, we were talking and he's like, look, we're going to bring you in. We're going to hire you Here's a contract, but you still got to be okay by the head coach, but it looks like everything's going to be good. Yeah. I'm like, Okay. <laughs> so I get in there. I get in there right around March 15th. I start working for the team. Season's over. They're, they're right around out of the playoffs, you know? Um, so I finished the rest of the year. I finished the rest of the year with the Mavericks that come home, you know, and then we do summer league and all that. And then, yeah, I ended up lasting six years. And that was different because it wasn't just working out players. Like I thought I was just going to be a workout coach, you know, a player development coach, like anyone else. And, they had me when they told me they want to be be like during August of that summer. They're like, no, we want you to be director of player development. Like not only working out players, but like we want you to to sort of mold these players into serviceable players that will go long term. So I worked with a, a sports psychologist named Don Cockstein, who worked for uh, baseball and basketball. He worked for the Mavericks, worked for the Rangers, but worked for the Red Sox at, at okay. the time when they were winning those uh, in 04 when they won the World Series. He worked for them for a while as well. So we worked together at not only like, all right, what are we going to, you know, what am I going to do with the, on the court with the players, but also like off the court meetings, talking about their role, holding them accountable, had them, having a system where they're going to be like being prepared to be a pro, like coming early, you know, you know, setting up a, a deal where they have to come in 90 minutes before practice and do all this stuff, all these things before practice, like, have to watch film, have to eat, have to get shots up, have to, you know, uh, work with the trainer, the strength coach, watch film with the coach, you know, all these things. So we wanted to make sure that we were developing these players 360 degrees of not only on the court, but off the court where either for the Mavericks or for another team that we trade them to, or they get released that they were going to be serviceable professionals and know, yeah. know how to be a good pro and not only on the court, but the off the court things. And I'm not talking about setting up a checkbook or anything like that. I'm yeah. talking about how do you handle coaching? How do you handle adversity? How do you handle, you know, how do you handle being early, staying late, being prepared? How do you memorize the names of the people in your travel party? How do you, you know, seek out coaches to get advice? How do you talk to coaches in meetings, yeah. you know, and then getting that information from coaches about what Johnny wasn't doing well enough, why they weren't playing. So instead of just allowing him to die on the vine and, and, and get cut or not be a, an NBA player because he wasn't cutting enough or he wasn't making that corner three enough we wanted to make sure we got as much feedback from the coaches as possible and then give that feedback to the player to at least let them know literally like a cheat sheet of what they need to be doing to become really good NBA players. And, and most of the players you're going to get aren't going to be all-stars. 80% of the players that play the game are role players. 
you know, yeah. they they get they're not getting players called to them. They're just you know they're good players. Of course, they're the best at what they do, but you know, most they're only going to be two or three players that really matter on the team. Everybody else is going to have to just sort of figure things out. So my thing was, look, it's not about getting high draft picks and, and developing a guy like a Luka Doncic, who's going to be great on whoever works with him. Yeah. But getting that late draft pick, getting that undrafted player, getting that player that's been on his third team, you know, getting them stabilized and put, getting them on a sort of path of being a good NBA player and teaching them what they really need to be doing. Because there's so much bad advice out there and so many people want to give it that these players listen to the wrong people. So yeah. We did a really good job. I mean, from they didn't really do a good job of that before I got there. And, you know, and being able to meet with Don Coxstein and meet with the medical team and meet with talk to coaches about the development side. I think that was very positive in the development of the players. Like we had guys like, you know, you might know the name might not Dwight Powell, who was a throw in in the Rondo trade and played at Stanford he ends up being a starter making, you know, he'll, he'll, he'll end up making over a hundred million dollars in his career being, you know, a serviceable player. Dorian Finney-Smith undrafted out of Florida, couldn't shoot. Uh, we hired a shooting coach. It was fantastic. His name was Peter Patton, really got him to teach him and learn how to shoot the ball correctly. And then he became one of the best three and D guys in the NBA, like one of the best defenders for sure. And now he's shooting 40% from the three and increased his value to, you know, again, a player you didn't have to pay a lot of money to, to now being a starter and a, and a big time role player for that team. And then we had a kid named Maxi Kleber. Who he signed out of Europe, out of Germany, who like was injured. So our medical team did a great job with him and then streamlining him into what he really needed to be doing in the league. And now he's a player making $8 million a year and being a starter to a really good rotation player. So in development, it's not about just taking great players and, and working with them. A lot of people like to do that. You know, if you take a Kevin Durant or a Steph Curry and you work with them every day, and no offense to the people who work with them now, I'm just using the name. Yeah. But like, if you're Steph, Curry, you're working out Steph Curry and you're patting yourself in the back that he's making all these shots. It's like, you know, it's like saying that, yeah, you know, I'm the reason that, you know, I'm the reason why Greek Freak could jump high. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's it, a lot of that stuff's God given. Yeah. But if you could turn a player that had a high percentage risk factor of failing, not really being, not really getting to the second contract, in the NBA, because they're, a, they couldn't do something or they're a late draft pick or they were thrown in a trade and you turn them into a serviceable NBA player. To me, that's true player development. If you could turn the 10th, 11th, 12th best player consistently every year, by the end of the year or by the, or the end of two years or so, if you could turn them into the eighth, ninth, 10th, seventh, eighth, ninth best player and consistently could move that, move the needle like that. I think that's what true player development is. That's, that's amazing. That's, that's very, that's amazing. I think that the program they guys put in Dallas is just absolutely amazing. And being able to do that work with those players. And I mean, look, I mean, says it all. We just mentioned the guys' names like Dorian Green Smith and the guys that you worked with. How about Jalen Bronson? You worked with him as well too, right? Yeah. And yeah, I, I worked him out before games, but Jalen, again, Jalen was one of those turnkey players. Yeah. Really good high school player. Not only was he a talented player, but obviously his dad played in the league, but he's a winner. Yeah. And that's the one thing when we, you know, when we drafted, when we drafted Jalen. That's the thing that we had, we just said, like, that's the thing that every scout said. He's a winner, winner, winner. Like he already, already had a work ethic. He came from a championship organization, a championship school in Villanova. He was always a high character guy. He's competitive. He's a, you know, great, just great bones as far as like just being a professional. So you didn't really have to do a lot of work with Jalen. Uh, he worked with Peter Patton, shooting coach you know, sort of cleaned a little bit up with the shot, but like all a guy like that needs to be able to do is get minutes because the 90 minutes early, the, all the other things that he, we needed him to do, he already did before. So yeah. it wasn't like, we never really had to like worry about him. And he, he sort of flourished into the player that he is. And he would have flourished like that in most teams. All you have to do with a guy like that, because he's, um, he's already like, say, say you got a hundred percent development right 100 like this is your odom odometer as far as being a de develop in your game yeah you get it, it's 100 most players when you get them in the nba at around 45 
you know, they, you know, 45%, even a really good player. Yeah, now a yeah. great player is probably at like 65, yeah. 70, 75. There's still room to develop, but for the most part, they've done it. Well, most players are like 45, 50, and you could probably get them to like, you know, no one's going to ever get to hundred percent, but you could probably get them to like 80, 85% of their development. Yeah. Well, Jalen was already at like, you know, because of the foundation that he had and the success that he had, he was already at like 65, 70, you know what I'm saying? Like he was already above ahead of the curve as far as the things that you have to teach him, like routine scheduling, like what to work on, you know, uh, how to take care of your body, all those things he already knew. And then all he needed then were minutes because you could work out until the cows come home. If you don't get minutes to make mistakes, you're never going to be a really good player in this thing. Yeah. And that's what Jalen did. He made mistakes. Like he was able to make those mistakes and learn, but like the skill part, he already had most of his, already his game in place. Yeah. And they you know, so I, like, that's why I call him a turnkey guy. He, he wasn't rough around the edges, you know, like where socially he was just a guy that you have to worry about all the time. He was like, he was, he was worried. He was, more put together than most of our veterans like the guy wow the guy's ridiculous and he's a winner and he's going to make a lot of money in this he's going to have a lot of success at this um yeah to be able to work with a guy like that it's so easy it's yeah. you know it's so easy makes your life a lot easier but <laughs> unlike most of the players in the nba they're not easy to work with because again every player that you work with and, and i guess most of, it's like this probably in division one when you're recruiting too most of the players that you draft, I don't care if you draft them at one or 60 or undrafted. Yeah. Most of those players were the LeBron James of their team, yeah, of their yeah. high college team. They got every play called to them. They, they could shoot 25 times a game and, and they, you know, the, the coach kept encouraging it. They were asked to do seven or eight different things. They were the man. When you get to the NBA, especially when you get drafted by a good team, Dallas at the time, you know, they were a playoff team. They two years, you know, coming off winning a championship. So if you came to play for Dallas as a rookie, A, you're going to be drafted probably somewhere in the 20s. Second, like you're already going to have Dirk and Whiskey, you know, Dirk and Whiskey and two other guys that are going to be much better than you. You know, so at very best, you're looking at you're the fourth option on the floor. So you went from getting the ball in your hand 90%, 98% of the time to now having the ball in your hand 10% of the time. You, instead of like running every pick and roll in isolation to you, you're sitting in the corner waiting for someone to double Dirk and they're going to pass it back out to you. And, and so it's more of a spot up situation, more of you got to play defense or screen or do something else. Yeah. And again, if you, if you look at it, Jeff, there's 510 players that play in the NBA, 450 roster players plus 60 two-way players. Yeah. It's 510 players, 105 to 110 players or less get 10 shots or more a game. So what that tells you is 80% of the league don't get plays called to them. So they got to figure out offense by spot ups or cuts or transition or, you know, you know, they're not really having the ball in their hands. They're a secondary third, you know, third option, fourth option, fifth option. So being able to downshift, you know, gears from a player and say, look, you have to survive now without having the ball in your hands. You have to survive like doing other things that you probably didn't have to do at your college team. You have to build into this role with your coach to develop this relationship and develop this trust that he has in you, that you're going to do this one really good thing instead of trying to do too much on the floor so he can trust you to get minutes. Yeah. And then you have to, you know, and then you have to worry about getting traded. You have to worry about getting hurt. You have to worry about getting cut. So all like all this stuff comes in and say, look, that might happen. No doubt about it. But we need to sort of we need to dig out a role for you and you need to you need to embrace that. And then what happens is when you do that one thing really well and not only that he can trust that you're going to do it, but you're going to have results doing it. Then yeah. we're going to add this one more thing. And then this summer, we're going to add this other thing. And then this other thing, and this other thing. And then hopefully by year five, if you make it that long with us, by year five, year six, now you're going to have this way bigger role. Yeah. But it doesn't start always where we're just going to put the ball in your hand and you're good. You yeah. know, and that's the problem too. Like 
you know, you get drafted, you go to summer league, which summer league is like, there's no real NBA players in summer league besides the rookies that are the rookies are the second year players that already played in the NBA or the rookies that are, you know, just got drafted. So the players that you play against are going to be mostly D league players, players played overseas, minor league guys. Um, they're not, or, or, you know, they're not going to be NBA players. Yeah. So like you do really well in summer league and your roles, like, of course you get drafted. They're going to want to run every play to you to a get good publicity from you. And people think you could really play B it gives you a lot of confidence going forward and seeing what you can really do in, in, in sort of having this bigger role in this situation, but it could be very like, it could be a messing with somebody's mind because now they get to the team in August and September and they're off this high of not only their college career, but also like what they did in summer league. And now they got a downshift. And I think that's the biggest problem. If I look, I get what you did in summer league, but the reality of now being with NBA players, this is what we're going to ask you to do. So we really need them to have a good foundation of being a pro of like all this stuff about being early, staying late, working out, taking care of your body, you know, doing the right things. And then putting it with this one thing that they're going to do and having discipline and holding the line and then building off of this one or two things. And then don't really look too far ahead in the future, but in the future, we feel as though you can be this, but in the meantime, to get to that point, you need to do these, these sort of three or four things, you know, gradually and build that up with this foundation. And then hopefully everything stays on track and you can become this player. There's a lot of great success stories in the NBA that you see on social media or NBA documentary, things like that. But a lot of it, a lot of it ends in horror. A lot of it ends where it's, it wasn't enough time. The player wasted too much time, you know, trying to fight this one role that they've had and the player, the team just traded or cut them or traded for another player that had that role, you know? Yeah. And so it's tough, man. It's not, it's not an easy deal. When you think of development, people just think of oh, these fancy drills you throw on Instagram. Yeah. But a lot of it has to do with this other part of it that, you know, that you really have to spend a lot of time communicating that with the player and the coaches and the team, and then the player needs to buy in. So having enough presence to have the player buy in is huge. huge. Yeah. yeah, that's that's very true. And like you said, there are so there are those great sex stories, but there are also those stories that you hear about that guys didn't make the NBA or something they didn't get in the right situation or just they didn't want to buy into the system or whatever. And you know, and you met you brought up some great points about that too. Like you are you are the LeBron James or the Michael Jordan of your team. But then when you come into the NBA, now you're not having that percentage of the ball in your hand. And you just gotta make that adjustment as well too. Like you said, it messes with your psychology too with summer league and everything. Yeah. And dealing with Don Cox, yeah. I, I thought about it a little bit, like, again, I, I was mostly, yeah, I, you know, obviously I could talk to players and, and I did yeah. some stuff on the mental side without even knowing I was, but talking to Don every day and DK every day about like the mental works of a player and, you know, cause he, he's got a baseball background. So he would talk to me a lot about, about minor league baseball and the development and, you know, getting the baseball approach to development and, organizations and things so him and i have in countless hours of conversation of you know what it's going to take to get these guys sort of year in and year out because in the nba you don't want to go out and sign players in free agency you really in a perfect world you don't yeah you want to draft your own players you want to develop them and because it's a lot cheaper to do that and like look if you're going to go out and get a big time free agent Kawhi Leonard, or whatever yeah you always do that yeah but like if you're trying to build your team just off for free agency, you don't have enough money to do that because a, you need a foundation of players that you build yourself to like, to just place this great player on top of those players yeah. and then you're ready to roll. And you just can't buy those players. Cause of like, if somebody develops them and you want this player, it's going to cost you, you know, $14 million a year to get yourself a starter, an average starter at yeah. 14 million, you know, a, a little bit above average starter. Where like if you drafted and developed that player and you got them under a rookie contract, yes, eventually it's going to cost you 14 million. But if you can develop them in the first two years of their four year deal, now you've got a productivity of a player in their third or fourth year, like Terrence Mann, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Terrence Mann's on his rookie deal and he's producing probably at a $12 million rate and you're getting him at, I don't know what they pay Terrence Mann the second year of his deal. Maybe they pay him a million dollars or a million two. So you're getting $12 million of production for 1.2. Now they'll probably have to sign him for 50 million over four years this summer. I think he, I think he's up for an extension. So like, yes, that's going to come into play. But you don't want to continue to do that every year where you're grabbing those from other other teams. teams yeah, yeah. You know, if you're going to have to do it with your own guy, that's one thing. So you need a foundation of these second round picks, of these undrafted players, of these first round picks that end up, you end up moving the bar with every year where now you have a collect after a four year period, you might have a collection of out of your 15 players, six, you know, six come from your development. And then, you know, and then now you have your other veterans that you sign or trade for, yeah. but like you need that foundation of that. And if you're a division one team, so say you're URI and you're not getting McDonald's all Americans to come to URI. Yeah. I always say this, the two foundation, the two cornerstones for any good college team, because most college, most college teams are mid-level teams. They're not big time teams. So not like Even that, Providence yeah. College. You need to be able to identify talent, bring that talent in, especially you need to identify sleepers and under the radar guys. And you need to be able to not only bring those guys in, but then develop them and know what to do with them to turn them into players. Because, you, to, you know, if you're Providence and you got to go against Georgetown, you got to go against, you know, St. John Xavier, whoever the top teams are in the, in the big villain over, of course, yeah. In the Big East, like you gotta you gotta compete with that. You're not competing with that with just the players that you bring in. You yeah, you because know, like I always tell a, a team that's on the bottom level of a high major school, like if I'm Boston College, right? If I'm Boston College and I come in and North Carolina, Virginia, Virginia Tech is in the gym with the player I'm recruiting, I'm walking the I'm walking out. Yeah, because there's no way I'm gonna uh, get a player over those guys. So I need to identify that player that no, maybe mid majors are recruiting or like Atlantic 10 teams are recruiting. Yeah. And I need to not only bring that player in, but I need to be able to develop them consistently develop my recruits to now in two you know, with the transfer portal, it doesn't work this way anymore, but like within two years or two and a half years of bringing this class in, I want to have this stable of players that now I can go with. And now we could start winning and then people are going to start taking notice and bigger players are going to want to come to my school. So if you can't identify talent, which, I mean, that's the number one, you know, the number one thing, I guess, to coach college basketball, you need to be able to do. But if you can't develop that talent, it's just going to be a, a revolving door of players and it's not going to be good. No, definitely not. It's like, well, it's like, well, uh, Chicago, right? Like yeah. their team, their seniors are like, they went to that, they made that championship run. Yep with their team and then again two years later same those guys that were sophomores on that team got the player development and now they've made another run in the NCAA tournament like it's just like those things of like the NCAA like those like you said you're not everyone's Kentucky or Duke or those master schools like a URI you have to develop your players to you know eventually those three or four year players become are like the teams that make the long run in the NCAA tournament to get the wins. Yeah, and that's the same thing with small market teams in the NBA. Yeah. You got to be able to do that. And that's why small market baseball teams, you need to be able to draft good players. And that's why money ball was so important because like the Oakland A's wasn't going to overspend. I mean, that's the, that's what I'm talking about. Like they're trying to, like the Yankees could just pull guys. The Red yeah. Sox could just pull guys from other teams and, and pay them whatever. You can't do that if you're the Oakland A's. So you need to get players that no one else wants that you see talent in. Yeah. And now if that that's your free agent game. I'm talking about now you need to be able to draft players, develop them through the minor leagues, and then, you know, hopefully you get some, you know, quick production out of them within the first few years. So before they need to sign a big deal that you can, you know, now you can, you could develop them where you get that two years of productivity yeah. before you really have to pay them. And I think that not enough college teams take that in consideration. It's all about recruiting, game coaching, practice coaching, but it's not really about player development truly. And that's, you know, I have a developmental um, service that I, that I have for co division one college teams where that's where I'm trying to help with, excuse me, where I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to streamline their developmental program on and off the floor 
to be able to coach their coaches to, to, you know, to develop players better. And I think that they need to be able to do that on a consistent basis. Yeah, definitely. I think your like business, if you get back to it now, like open control and, and what you're doing, I think is um, just speaking this whole conversation of what we had and absolutely just amazing conversation, but like what you're doing and the things that you're pointing out, I don't think a lot of people think about. And I think it's amazing that you have that, this business now that you're doing and everything like that. <laughs> it's not a sexy way to think about it. Like I, I, I call myself the catfish of player development. I'm a, bo- I'm a bottom feeder. I, I am a complete bottom feeder. I, when I come into a situation like with Dallas, right? Like yeah. at the end, my last year there, like I'm, I was very friendly with Luka Doncic because that was my job to do so. And he was a good kid. Like I, I hit it off with him, but I'm not there to work out Luka Doncic. Like I'm there to find, I'm there to get the guys at the end of the bench and make them serviceable. Yes. Cause if you can do that and, and that's not a sexy thing because like, the media doesn't take pictures of you and put them on social media, working out the worst player in your team. Like that's not a sexy thing. Assistant coaches that want to get move on. They want to work with the better players and be seen with the better players. I don't care about that. I wanted to take the players that no one else wanted to work with and trying to turn them into players. Like most of t- development today, like, especially like trainers and things. And, and I, I got no problem with trainers. I mean, there's a million ways to do this. I came from that. So I, I'm not, I'm not going to be condescending and I'm not going to be hypocritical. Like I came from that world. So I understand it. There are some good ones and bad ones, just like every, every other, you know, fraternity. Right. Yeah. But like most of them want to work with the division one players and the guys that are already going like big time or NBA players that are already established. I want to meet the trainer that like works with the mid range player that I'm in the middle of the road player that turns them into a good player. Yeah. I don't want, I don't want to, I don't want the trainer. I don't want to see the trainer that's taking an, an all-star player at any level and then patting themselves on the back at the end of the day. Like that's not development today. That is sort of, but, but like there's a sexy part of player development. And then there's like the not so sexy part of player development. And to me, being able to take a player that's limited and turn them into a serviceable player is huge dividends for me. Like, I love that. That's the, that's what development is. And the only way to do it is to have some type of philosophy of like when the player turns to you uh, case in point, there's a player, there was a player that we had um, that played in Rhode Island. His name is Ricky Lito, yep. you know, yeah. big yeah. time player out of Rhode Island, like big time talent. And, you know, look, he, he was a, he was a, he, you needed to work with him. I mean, there, there was a, there was a lot to work with, you know, as far as like what he didn't know and what he needed to know. And as far as being a pro, but he was so talented. And he taught me a lot and a lot, you know, I remember after the first summer, we, uh, the second summer, he finally said in a conversation, he goes, pro, do you guys have a plan for me? Like any type of a plan. Cause like I'm playing the D league, I'm doing my thing, but like, it doesn't seem like I'm doing it. Like I'm going anywhere with this. Do you, what's your plan for me? Yeah. And to be honest at that time, I didn't have a plan. Like I thought like, at some point he was going to get time for us and see if he could play or not. We're going to work with him and continue to, you know, make him better. But then that sort of, it, it sort of clicked that every player that you work with, you need a plan of attack. You need to know where he is, where he needs to go or where he or she needs to go. And like the steps that are needed to get there and like thing like sort of, Sort of like in four months, you need to be doing this. In three months, you need to be doing this. Yeah. But like, here's the steps to get there. But this is where I want you in three months. This is where I want you in three months. This is the role you need to play. This is the, this is your mentality, what it needs to be. And then, you know, and then, and then start from there. And I think that having a philosophy of what you do and how to evaluate it going forward, is probably one of the more important things you can do. Yeah, that's definitely a big thing in coaching and play development and having that philosophy and, and you grow with that philosophy and you change it as well. I think that's awesome. Well, this has been amazing. Like I have loved the conversation. It's been so much fun. Uh, it's been great, Jeff. I really, you know, I really appreciate you taking the time to have me on and be able to talk shop. I think anytime you could talk hoop, it's uh it's pretty cool. But you know, look, the, you know. I've had a fun time with this, you know, met a lot of amazing people, uh, a lot of ups and downs, um, being able to learn a lot from a lot of people and, and, and being lucky enough to sort of mentor a lot of coaches and players that sort of, you know, trust me to help them. And, 
you know, again, I think it's the any, it's just sort of the whole experience of the, of any walk of life, any sort of job that you have and the people that you meet and the good and the bad and the ugly of it. Cause it always sort of comes full circle and yeah. being able to do that and learn from some great people and then teach some great people. It's uh yeah, man, it's been a, it's been a wild ride, dude. It's been a wild ride. Yeah. You've had some great experiences and awesome. Just everything sounds like great, great, amazing experiences, great things, great people you work with. And I'm sure you have a ton of basketball connections and everything like that, but it's yeah, I need some money connections. So if you got that going, you know, let me know, man. I'll try, know. I'll try to figure it out if i hit the lottery i'll, I'll give you a call <laughs> i appreciate this yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah that'd be good yeah that'd be great well mike this has been a lot but i have one last question that i usually ask all my guests is sure just a general fun question uh, I, you do a lot with basketball but what's the one thing you like to do outside of basketball that when you're not working or anything like that oh man <laughs> uh Uh, my group chats are pretty funny. I mean, besides my family, of course, but yeah. like, I really like to spend time talking shit on my, uh, <laughs> on my, hopefully this is not a Christian network that you work with. Cause we'll, we'll get, we'll both get out yeah. of it this quick, but I, I love talking shit on my group chats, man. That that's, that's sort of a fun deal. Okay. Look, I watch a lot of TV, I, I, a lot of one liners and I love talking shit with my, my friends and, and, and people in, in different group chats and stuff. But that, yeah. that's sort of why I enjoy doing, I mean, Look, basketball takes up a lot of my time. My family takes up a lot of my time. Um, so, like, just TV is great. Um, Texting is great with my friends and stuff and, and, and sort of people that I've, you know, known my, most of my life. So, I don't know, man. What's your favorite? How about that? What's your favorite? Um, yeah, honestly, just spend time with my family. I have uh, two two dogs that I usually just kind of like to play and walk around. But a lot of times. Yeah, so what kind of dogs you got? I got two beagles. Oh, beagles! Nice. My wife won't let me get a beagle. They say that they're too uh, they're too loud and obnoxious. Uh yeah. Well, if the, usually one, I had I've always said beagles in the past, and I had one that like they were always great, but like with the two of them, it's like they encourage each other to bark. Who can? Oh, bark without better. question, they're little bastards, especially those smaller dogs. The bigger dogs are like compassionate; they love <laughs> yeah. you. Beagles are sort of in the middle. Yeah, for sure. They're, they're super question. loyal, but they're smart too. Like they, my two dogs open up the fridge. They know how to open up the fridge and take food out. Like that. Oh, really? Yeah, that's like something that that's like a new trick that they just learned. And I'm like, this. That's is, pretty cool. That's, I, I I didn't know that. Yeah, I wish I had learned to open up the fridge and give me a beer or something like that. But instead, it's you uh, got to step. You get you got to get West basketball people on your podcast. Get more dog trainers, man. Yeah, yeah I, am, I need I need that. But yeah, so yeah. that's that's what I like to do. And I have a, I have a, two nephews that I like this I love spending time with um one of them is actually getting big into basketball and then the other one is six so he's just playing he's actually playing baseball so nice just, tell him to enjoy it man tell yeah. him to enjoy it yeah so but that's that's my fun but hey Mike this has been a lot of fun I can't thank you enough for being on the show it just we got to do another episode I think I just I have to tell me like more questions Kobe questions and stuff like that so <laughs> well you got to thank Mike Lunny because without Mike you know without Mike this wouldn't have happened so Mike yeah. hit me up and, you know, like I said, I haven't talked to Mike in a while and his, uh, you know, his brother's a big U2 fan. I'm a huge U2 fan. So, you know, we, we've kept in touch over the years, but yeah, yeah if there's any finders free to be paid, Mike one, he definitely has to have to, has to do that. Don't pay Mike hard. He's made enough. He's stolen enough money over his years. You know, Mike, this money goes straight to Mike Lunny. Yeah. That sounds good. I'll, I'll give it to, uh, I really, yeah, thank, shout out to Mike Lunny for setting this up, uh, the director of the Rhode Island East Classic League here in Rhode Island. So thank you, Mike, for making this happen. I really appreciate it. And Mike, thank you very much for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Appreciate well, you. Appreciate you, Jeff. Thank you. I appreciate you, you know, having me on. Yeah, no problem.